Next on the Broadway show, The Skeleton Key. Why crowds are so excited about the incredible new play, Skeleton Crew. Plus, everybody's talking about Bianca. RuPaul's Drag Race winner, Bianca Del Rio, is here to talk about returning to the stage in L.A. and beyond. And Moulin Rouge, the musical, it's coming to a city near you. We're going to talk to Broadway director Alex Timbers. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. Each and every week we are fired up because Broadway is back. I'm so glad you could be here for The Broadway Show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. In the morning to the sound of the alarm. Got 35 minutes to be gone. Let's go ahead and kick things off with some of the great new shows that have arrived on the New York City stage. First up, Skeleton Crew. The play starring Felicia Rashad. It takes place in a Detroit auto factory in 2008 when the American economy was imploding, aka the Great Recession. Let's take you back to opening night. It's about a working family who love each other and will fight for each other no matter what's going on around them. And they keep hope in their hearts no matter what's going on around them. I hope that the music provides a soundscape that allows people to sink in and actually really feel immersed in the world of Detroit 2008 Auto Factory. What's important is that we, you know, we're weathering the storm. We're coming through the, this tornado called the pandemic and we're putting on theater and people are coming to see it and appreciating it. They're coming safe. They're coming uh, full of energy and they're coming ready to, to, to have a good time. We're back. It's it's hard for people in, the, in, in this time with the variant. It's pretty scary, but the way that the protocols are now for, for those, so many of the Broadway producers are making sure that everyone is safe in the theaters, we're back. I feel completely safe. Yes, I have my mask, but um, I feel completely safe in the theater and I'm looking forward to us all getting back and trusting, the, trusting the protocols. And MJ, the Michael Jackson musical is now officially open on Broadway. It's the Broadway thriller about the king of pop. With a book by Lynn Nottage, MJ stars Broadway newcomer Miles Frost. <laughs> The hit West End musical, Everybody's Talking About Jamie, just made its U.S. debut in Los Angeles. In the show, Roy Haylock plays Hugo, a.k.a. Loco Chanel, the mentor to young drag queen Jamie. Haylock is best known as Bianca Del Rio, winner of RuPaul's Drag Race Season 6. Paul Wontori caught up with Bianca to talk about the musical, designing costumes, dream roles, and a whole lot more. Bianca Del Rio, look at you, you're, you're backstage at a theater, I could tell. I'm very fancy. I'm at a theater here called the Almondson Theater in Los Angeles doing Everybody's Talking About Jamie. So this is not my dressing room, don't get excited. This is the green room that I'm in. Everyone knows you as the legendary drag superstar, but you're really a theater kid under all of it. And I know that's sort of where this all started for you. So what is it like to be in the run of a show? Oh, it, it's amazing, first of all. Legendary also makes me feel old, so I appreciate that but it's one of these things where um you know it kind of comes full circle because i started out in theater which is what led to drag and now getting this opportunity to be a part of the show which has been amazing this is my third uh, installment in the show because I've done it in the West End. I did it on a tour then. Now here, it's nice to be a part of a company. It's nice to be a part of a cast. Uh, it's nice to have someone else's words to say. Uh, so there's not as much responsibility as it is when you're writing, directing, producing your own stuff. So it's kind of like a, a leisure moment for me. You know, I get to revel in the luxury of being on stage with some brilliantly talented folks. Whenever I've seen uh, artists in situations like this, like, well, are we billing this as Bianca starring in this or Roy starring in this? But it's, it's Roy slash Bianca playing Hugo slash Loco. Yes, because I do play- A lot play of slashes. A lot of slashes going on here. But you know, my thing is whatever's gonna sell tickets. So for me, in the end, uh, it's one of those things where the show in particular, I start out the show out of drag, then I get in drag, and then I'm out of drag again. So it's one of those moments where there's a lot more Roy slash Hugo than there is Bianca slash Loco Chanel. So um, it is one of those moments where I'm doing a little more out of drag than I would normally do, but it's just a brilliantly written part. And you know, as I said, it's it's been a whirlwind to get to do and perform it. Actually getting to bring it to America has been, you know, surreal. So did uh, teen Roy at West Jefferson High School get to do 
uh, musical theater? Oh God, yes. I did the costumes, I did the sets, I did it all. I was doing everything but directing, but I was directing it in my own mind. But yeah, that's kind of where it started, uh, was in high school. And it was that kind of a thing where it just made sense, you know? And then I had all the makings to be a drag queen because I was doing everyone's hair, everyone's makeup, everyone's costume. And it just kind of snowballed from there. I also know that when you came to New York, one of the first things I learned about you was that you worked at Barbara Matera yeah. LTD, which is like a legendary yes. uh, co cost Broadway costume shop. Yeah, I mean, how lucky. I mean, it was one of those things because I was always involved in costumes. And when I moved to New York, I started at 890 Broadway. Uh, Barbara Matera was on the fifth floor. And, you know, it was one of those surreal moments where everything was created there. That was always my passion was doing costumes. So I would do costumes during the day and then I would do my drag at night and, and work the bars. And it was one of those things, as you know, living in New York, you're doing what you got to do to pay the rent. Did you ever get to like put on the uh, Alphaba costume yourself? Well, you know, we didn't hours? make Alphaba, we made Morrible. So Morrible. I was, Morrible. 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 Yeah. Morrible. That's good casting. Of course it is. Oh, yeah. Hopefully the movie's watching. We did Morrible and uh, I definitely had on Morrible many, many times. Do you have Broadway dreams of appearing on Broadway? Always, always, if anybody's listening. Uh, yeah, always have it. You know, and it's one of those things where I don't say no to much, as I've said, um, but I'm open to any of it. Please sign me up any day, sign me up. I have thought of some amazing roles you could play. Oh God. <laughs> and I would love I would love to do a little, who'd you rather? Like, okay. I'm gonna give you two options, okay? Perfect. And I, and I have them in categories. Okay. So the first category is 1920s party girls. Oh, we have okay. Mame Dennis uh -huh. in Mame or Velma Kelly in Chicago. I think at my age, I'd have to be Mame because I'm no Cheetah Rivera and I can't kick that high. So, you know, I have to be the nurturing older one. And if Lucy did Mame, I could do it with my voice. So that's good. Yes, I could do it. Yeah. Miss Hannigan and Annie or Mrs. Lovett in Sweeney Todd. Oh, you're killing me with this. I would, I like both. I like both because they're both demented. I'll take a risk here. I would say Hannigan. Uh, only because I could be mean to children. A pair of patty parts. Ava Perone in Evita or Mama Ooh. Rose in Gypsy? See, I think I look more like an Evita, but I think I'm more appropriate for a Mama Rose. You know, the battle axe mother that's pushing her children to the front. I think, I, yeah, I would, I would take Mama Rose over Ava Perone. These two are total animals. Grizabella in Cats or Ursula in The Little Mermaid? Oh, Ursula. I gotta be Ursula. Uh, I'm allergic to cats, can't do it, can't do it. <laughs> I'm allergic to real cats, not the production. The final one, this might be the hardest. Okay. The greatest stars of all, Norma Desmond and Sunset Boulevard or Dolly Levi and Hello Dolly. Norma Desmond, without a doubt. Norma Desmond is my thing, yes, yes. But staircase worries me and you have to eat all of those things, which is challenging. So I would say Norma Desmond because I can honestly say that I am up uh, a woman who wears a little too much makeup and in denial and does run around my house in a turban. So I'm a shoe in I'm a shoe in Moulin Rouge is this past season's most honored show at the Tony Awards. You can see it right now in New York. And starting next month, the North American tour of Moulin Rouge is hitting the road. Broadway.com correspondent Beth Stevens caught up with director Alex Timbers in this edition of Building Broadway. So here we are. Here we are at the Hirschfeld <laughs> Theater. And we're in a kind of a, an unusual room. Where are we? We are in, uh, I think, what the Jude Jamson calls the VIP lounge. So we're both very fancy people for this afternoon only. This is where uh, we would do a lot of production meetings and I think where people can come during intermission and have a drink. When people walk into Moulin Rouge, I noticed that conversation stops and people look around the theater and they ooh and they ah. Is yes. that something that you wanted to happen? Ever since that first preview in Boston, I love to, to stand closer to the stage and watch people come in right at 7.15 when they let people in and you just see these jaws drop when they see Derek's work and Justin Townsend's lighting. It's extraordinary and it, you know, they're transportive. From, the, from moment one, the theatrical envelope wanted to be the club. Let's talk more about that envelope because mm -hmm. like I said, when you walk into the theater, you're completely immersed into this different world. Tell me about some of the discussions you had with your collaborators. Derek McLean did the set and Kathy Zuber did the costumes. And from moment one, we wanted the elements to be period, but to be kind of uh, reorganized and juxtaposed in ways that might feel contemporary or surprising. Um, so that was one of the things that really governed us. We wanted the experience to be democratic. We wanted, if you're sitting in the last row of the balcony, to feel like you're surrounded by that world. It wasn't just a world of the stage or a world for you know the people sitting in house seats, that it, there were runways or ramps that performers could pop up next to you at any point. We want it to feel luxurious. We want it to feel like an incredible uh, nightclub, like an incredible theatrical space where uh, that felt uh, dangerous 
and exotic and enticing. The Moulin Rouge that didn't exist, but kind of dreamed of existing. What was your approach to the storytelling? Baz was an incredible sort of theater maker before he was an incredible filmmaker. And so he was very open to the idea of saying, this is an adaptation. This has to have different needs and rules that the, that the theatrical form will take. It's, it's a musical. And so we went through the process once John Logan was hired as the book writer and Justin Levine as the music supervisor and you know went into a hotel room. I, dragged my girlfriend's keyboard into there. We sat there and we had note cards and we sort of said, okay, let's re-break the story. And we said, how do we make the love triangle more dynamic? How do we make this more dangerous? How do we raise the stakes here and there? Just what does the form demand? It felt like you were breaking in a, you know, any other original musical as opposed to adapting one of the great movie musicals of all time. Sonia Taya came in, w amazing choreographer, and started you know, workshopping uh, dancer saying like, let me try this idea. She has this group of dancers she works with and in different rehearsal studios all over New York. So all this stuff's happening simultaneously while we're developing the design and everything's sort of feeding into each other. You're very good at bringing in pop culture mm -hmm. and Broadway. One of the things that I really care about is as someone who loves theater and is an advocate of theater, uh, and an evangelist of theater, uh, is when theater feels like it's in dialogue with popular culture and popular music. I remember the first show that hooked me so hard was Tommy, and seeing music video visuals on stage, uh, a score that connected with people who love musical theater, who thought they didn't love musical theater until that moment, and uh, that's the stuff that really gets me excited. What are you most proud of when it comes to Moulin Rouge? I think the thing I'm most proud of is the collaboration. I think the idea that you've got someone like John Logan who's who writes plays and writes these incredible like elevated genre movies like Alien and Skyfall, and then you've got Sonia from the world of concert dance, and you've got Aaron Tveit, you know, one of the great musical theater performers, and Robin Herder, like an amazing like Fosse interpreter, and that they all fit into this world and work well seamlessly together. That feels to me like something that I find aspirational as, as a director. Hangman is getting a second life on Broadway. It's a dark comedy from the writer of the film Three Billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. Back in 2020, Hangman had only 13 preview performances when Broadway theaters closed. As dark as this subject matter might appear to be, it's actually a laugh a minute uh, play uh, with twists and turns and uh, really interesting characters, um, which hopefully said something a little about the subject too. But there's a lot of humanity and a lot of fun to be had in the story, I hope. You know, I came here once on holiday and you walk past the theatres and you go, oh my god. You know, I saw I saw a few shows and never did I think I'd, I'd be on a Broadway stage, but I am here and I'm living every minute. There's still a lot more to talk about on this edition of the Broadway show. Coming up. We'll talk to one of Broadway's incredible performers about why he's just got to dance. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show, and we'll be right back. The $10 founding father still holds Broadway's hottest ticket, and Hamilton features some truly spectacular physical performances. We met up with one of the show's great performers at Open Jar Studios to find out why he's just got to dance. My name is Preston Mui. I am in Hamilton and I play George Eager in the ensemble. I first started dancing when I was 10 years old. I did my first musical, which was Oliver, and I became obsessed with the stage. At 10 years old, I decided to start training for my Broadway debut. <laughs> I took a dance class out of a home garage from my first dance teacher <laughs> at Star Dance Studio I am in San Francisco, California, where I just studied tap and jazz, and then eventually went to an arts high school. There I studied modern, contemporary, African ballet, and then um, I moved to LA, training in hip hop and jazz funk, and really learning the Hollywood ropes. When I first found out I was joining the Broadway Company of Hamilton, I was choreographing a show in Las Vegas and I actually wasn't expecting to come back to my journey as a performer. After 20 years of my career in Los Angeles, the thought of coming back to the stage and finally fulfilling my Broadway dream this late in my 
journey was so mind-blowing to me. The night of my Broadway debut, I remember messing up so much. Learning Hamilton is a huge undertaking. It's three hours long. You're learning it by yourself in a dance studio. And there's so much information you have to retain. And so the night of my debut, it was like I had to let all of that go and just perform whatever was gonna happen with my body and my voice. <laughs> and so, yes, mistakes were made, but it was so fun and everyone on stage is so supportive. They just helped move me along. It was just such an amazing experience. Dancing for audiences right now in Hamilton, especially after this pandemic, it has been cathartic for myself, but Knowing that I can bring a little bit of joy to people for a few hours in a night, it's, it's better than what it does for me. It's more that I get to do something for other people while also doing something I love. If my younger self knew that I was where I am now, that little chubby Asian kid with a bowl cut would be freaking so excited. <laughs> my younger self would just be really happy to know that all the hard work was worth it. What I'm most proud of isn't one job in particular or one person that I've ever worked for. It's mostly that I was able to forge a way into this industry and to maintain a career and to create a livelihood for myself in an industry that doesn't have a lot of representation for people like me. So I feel most proud that I was able to stand on my own two legs and really just work and create a lane for myself and for others coming after me. Thanks for staying with us for this latest episode of The Broadway Show. So glad you're here. I know you wanna leave me, but I refuse to let you go. Okay, let's talk touring shows, because Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations is coming to a city near you. Marcus Paul James got his start in the show on Broadway as a swing. Now he's leading the national tour as Otis Williams. Hi everyone, my name is Marcus Paul James and I play Otis Williams in the national tour of Ain't Too Proud, The Life and Times of the Temptations. So rising to the challenge of playing Otis Williams has been definitely a feat. When I first joined the show and I saw the masterfulness of Derek Baskin and the brilliant writing of, and what he was doing with Dominique Morisot's book. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. Is that on my contract to do? And that was uh, intimidating. <laughs> to be honest, it was intimidating. But once I actually started to go on, um, with the cast and in and got to be a part of the boys, I realized that, oh, you're not starting from zero. You're starting where they're starting. And you're starting with so much support and you're starting with so much love and guidance. And there's an entire team that's wanting you to, to succeed. And so that just made it, made it even easier to kind of like, all right, maybe I'll, I'll do it. Maybe I'll, you know, cause I had to cover it anyway. Um, and then once you actually step put onto the footlights as Otis, you realize the purpose and you realize the, the responsibility you have to tell this story. And what honor is it to tell the story of these black men and Otis Williams, the living legend with a 60 year music career? Who, who, would I, who would I be if I were not excited to tell this story? So then, you know, you just quickly move all your fears aside and step on faith and love with all the support. And, and then they asked me to do it here. And so I was like, absolutely. One step at a time, one hope then another. Who knows where this road may go? In honor of Black History Month, another one of our great touring shows is making history. The national tour of Anastasia has hit the road with stops in 40 cities. Kyla Stone is the first black woman to take the show's lead. We recently caught up with Kyla at New York City's Russian Tea Room. The only thing that scares me is how I'm gonna make it through without just crying every night. I think that's really the one thing where it just feels like 
so great to sing this score and so amazing to go on Anya's journey because mm. she is so strong and she's learning about herself and that's just overwhelming. But really just knowing that it holds so much for so many people and taking on that, that mountain of, of being a princess and, and going on that journey. And that's going to do it for us. Until next time, I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show.